Welcome to BNews Weekly Special Report. I'm Phil Gallagher, along with my guest today, Rick Parker, President and CEO of the Burlington Area of Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Rick. Happy to be here, Phil. Rick is in his sixth year in the position, and uh, I'm sure it, it hasn't been quite as difficult up to this point as it has been over the last six months. So let's open with a general question of uh, what's life been like for Rick Parker since, uh, since February 12th? Well, I would say uh, before the pandemic, I wasn't really sure how Zoom operated. <laughs> now I'm, I'm not quite sure how we ever got by without it, but uh, doing business remotely has become a necessity for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and there have certainly been challenges that weren't uh, expected, but the business community, like, like most people in the, in the Commonwealth, has been very resilient and, uh, and have met the challenges head on. Now, how frequently are you meeting with your various subcommittees, your board of directors? Well, a, a heavier schedule than normal? Much, much mm -hmm. more, uh, more heavy schedule. We've met throughout the process with state, federal legislators, um, with the town itself, uh, with the board and uh, different subcommittees. It's really been um, quite, a, quite an experience going from uh, Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting and then at the end of the day figuring out okay, all that information, how do we put it in the best manner to communicate it to our members and to have a unified force going forward? Yeah. And that's been, uh, it's been a challenge, but here we are, we're, yeah. we're, we're moving forward. Well, go through the levels of government for me in terms of their responsiveness to your questions and the questions of your, your membership from federal, state, local, et cetera, on the issues that they're facing. Well, we'll start at the federal level. Um, there was initially Seth Moulton's office reached out to us. We've been on normal um, routine communications to try to understand what the legislation was that they thought would come down at the federal level and how it would impact us here in the Commonwealth, allowing for that communication to be both ways. Uh, so we, we would um, ask questions. Where do you think this is going? Certainly um, no one's been in this situation before. So we try to take our best guesses on what we think the federal government will do. And then we go down to the state government and say, where are those holes that the federal government won't be filling and how can the state government help? Uh, we have regular meetings with Secretary Keneally's office, uh, the Office of Housing and Economic Development, to be that conduit between government and the businesses. Now, if you remember, if you know it all that there is no secret hotline when you push the button and I can co I communicate with, with all the businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the chamber really served as, uh, as that conduit to be able to communicate questions and concerns from mm -hmm. the business community to the government and also figure out what the government was able to do and what wasn't able to do and try to uh, figure out how we would go forward in meeting the new guidelines. There's a clearinghouse. Absolutely. What were the federal programs? Now explain to me what PPP was. <clears throat> well, let's start at the beginning. The first one that came out was the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. This gave uh, businesses an opportunity to get a loan through the SBA at, um, at a favorable rate, around 3%, but what it allowed um, was a grant of $1,000 per employee. Mm -hmm. So that was a, an immediate injection of, of a minor amount of money to most small businesses but it got them over the first you know, couple of days. Then the PPP, which is, is the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, allowed employee, employers to pay their employees for eight weeks, basically, the amount of money that if they could keep their employees on the staff, it would allow them to be able to pay their employees, and if it went strictly to payroll, then it would be forgiven, so it would be, be a grant. A great idea. Um, and it was a great shot in the arm for businesses. But there were some abuses. The, there were abuses in the first round, and um, I think those have been well documented where mm -hmm. it didn't make it to some of the small businesses that really needed it most. In the second round, those, um, those were taken care of, and it really did make it to those businesses that needed it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the eight-week period, many of these businesses weren't uh, allowed to open during that period, so now they're paying their employees yet they haven't opened yet. So when the door did finally open, it was back to square one. Mm -hmm. There has been modifications to the Paycheck Protection Program to allow that to go out to a 24-week period. Um, it's really gonna be all about being able to bring income back into these businesses and be able to get the employees back. At the same point, um, 
the unemployment system, uh, Massachusetts has the most liberal unemployment system, with the federal government adding $600 a week, some employees are making significantly more than they were when they were employed, which is great to take care of those employees through this difficult time. But now that it's time to get back to work, it, it is posing some challenges to get employees uh, willing well, to Well, that's to work. what we're hearing in certain areas that people don't want to come back to work uh, until this benefit runs out the entire period because they're making more money. We will see that as employees have been offered the job back, employers right now are, are moving down the line to the other employees to see if they want to come back. But there will come a time when you know being offered the job back does disqualify them for unemployment going forward and there'll be some real hard decisions to be made at that point. Luckily we're not there yet and as businesses open up and get employees back it's being done in a very cautious and, and slow, slow manner to, to make sure that we don't step backwards. Right. Now at the state level uh, it's the unemployment benefit but what else was, uh, was offered as legislation uh, in, in an effort to help business? There is um, the, ec the Housing and Economic Development Office, uh, Secretary Keneally's office, really was involved in finding out what impact this would have on businesses and putting them into that four-stage reopening plan. Um, there was a lot of pushback initially when people um, were locked out of being able to open. Um, only what was considered to be essential services were open and people, you know, why am I in the first class or the second or the third? How am I going to make it through that? And to be How honest, did liquor stores get into essential well, services? Well, that's, that's, that's a <laughs> that's question that many, many people have asked. Um, but what we've seen is it was done in the most fair manner possible. And going back, and we've asked on a couple of things, you know, how could a hair salon be open but a nail salon not be open? These were the questions that were being asked. And when it came down to it, there had to be some hard decisions to make sure that as segments were opened that we weren't doing it too quickly and going to set us all back. Mm -hmm. The real challenge was, and, and I, I want to say thank you to the public um, in the greater Burlington area and the state because it really has been you in it, abiding by these regulations mm -hmm. and, and understanding that businesses are really in a tough position. But it, without the cooperation of the public, this would all just roll back. And we're starting to see that in other states where mm -hmm. this wasn't taken so seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you to you, to you if, any, mm -hmm. if you're out there watching, and, and please continue to comply with, with the regulations. Well, but this resistance as a result of this going on for so long. Um, do you see that increasing as we go along, that people just are, are tired of being stuck at home and tired of being out of work? Yeah, I think um, that tends to be a problem with the public as, as a whole. We're mm -hmm. all tired. Right. We're tired of this. Unfortunately, tired the, and bored. <laughs> the, the virus and the data will determine mm -hmm. how we move forward. Uh, the governor has been data driven and not date driven, uh, which I commend him for that. I mean, certainly there's times when we would like to see things happen quicker, but we understand the process. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those that were in stage three of the reopening process needed people in stage one and stage two to do their work to make the numbers go down. And we've been fortunate here in the Commonwealth where the numbers have maintained and gone down dramatically recently. Mm -hmm. um, so phase three is um, starting on, June, on July 6th, Monday, July 6th. And that will be the last of the reopening until uh, you know we get a vaccine or something that's going to um, mm -hmm. get us back to the new normal and I shouldn't say get us back get us forward mm -hmm. going back we're not you know I, I, I find it hard to believe that we will ever see what we saw before especially when it comes to um, working from home and telecommuting well I, I want to get into that as a separate subject but let's go to the next tier and, and get uh, your response to cooperation from the local community. How, what are the things that have been done there? What kind of cooperation are you getting? I would absolutely love to commend Paul Sagarino, uh, Melissa Tintakalis, Kristen Kasner. We worked in advance of these, the reopening process to find out what we thought would need to do on a local level. And that was exhibited uh, perfectly in the outdoor opening for outdoor dining regulations. We were ahead of it, the process to expand outdoor dining or to do outdoor dining for the first time was very streamlined. Uh, we had uh, the, the police department, the Board of Health, uh, thanks to them as well. I don't want to leave them out. Board of Health has been 
instrumental in everything that's been done for both residents and the business community. It was a streamlined process and the restaurants were able to move forward with outdoor, outdoor dining in, in record time. I mean, mm -hmm. if anything has come out of this, the, the relationship between business and government has been strengthened and no, nowhere is that better exhibited than here, here in town. Right. And the town government's done a fantastic but job. But the bottom line for both is revenue. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea that we're all in this together is nonsense. Uh, certain businesses have been crushed. Certain areas of the economy have been crushed, while others have been unaffected. Uh, certainly one of those areas, two of those areas in particular, are retail businesses and the restaurants. Um, First of all, do you see this as a competitive, dramatic competitive advantage for Amazon, for instance, who is likely, likely to have a huge increase in their, in their market share going forward? Unfortunately, yes. Um, we, we don't say the word Amazon at the chamber, we say mm. the, big, the big A. Mm. Um, it's, it's a natural progression where people are at home and have no other option. Mm -hmm. Those of us that um, you know, continue to support local brick and mortar, um, I, I, I'll speak for myself, I did not shop online, but people were forced to shop online mm -hmm. and, and saw what the ease was. Mm -hmm. Local retailers um, have got a challenge for them going mm -hmm. forward like, like never before. Um, so we talk about retailers and hospitality uh, restaurants were by far the hardest hit and we'll have the hardest recovery. Um, so it's important for people to remember when you say we're in this all together, and I mean no disrespect to Amazon and online shopping, when your money goes to Amazon, it's gone. Yeah, when sure. it goes to the local economy, it stays here. Mm -hmm. And you know, it pays local taxes, and it also helps support you know, community organizations, people helping people, sure. uh, Boy Scouts, and, and the sports groups that, that really rely on that business yeah. connection. Well, that's my biggest fear is that, uh, you know, we have a lot of bricks and mortar here that's retail, uh, you know, the mall in particular, and, uh, and certainly the three months, first of all, from their cash flow just to keep operating, uh, but secondly, the in, now the ingrained habit of just going online and buying from Amazon is going to be hard to break. Let's go to the next uh, group particularly hit was, uh, particularly hard hit, excuse me, uh, the restaurant business. Uh, how in the world are these people going to recover if we're talking about 25% occupancy rates and no bars, which I think alcohol represents 40 to 45% of gross revenue in a restaurant? How are these people going to recover uh, going forward? That's a great question, Phil. Um, it's going to be slow, and there will be, there will be some fallout, uh, I'm fairly sure. If you look strictly at the numbers, um, Without the daytime population that, that our community depends on, now you're relying on a residential community and most people who are now working from home, some of them in their pajamas from the waist down, are not as likely to be going to lunch and or dinner during mm -hmm. the day, they'll, they'll right. make it at home. Um, but the restaurant um, community means so much to, to our community. Um, meals tax alone pays, pays for a lot of things sure. that are going on here in town. Um, they're going to have it very difficult, and uh, now with the six-foot distancing on, on inside dining, that's as good as it's going to get. There will be no additional um, provisions to allow any more people coming in. Not even in phase four? Not e well, in phase four, yes. In phase okay. four, <clears throat> when there is a vaccine, we can, we can go back to, to normal. To yeah, but the likelihood of an effective vaccine is kind of out there, isn't it? I mean, would you take a three-month-old vaccine for anything? It's, it's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a challenge. So you, you were right in the restaurant mm -hmm. community being hard hit. And keep in mind, the people who work in the hospitality industry, these are people people. Um, sure. These are the ones that we've been working with on a day-to-day -day basis to try to get them through it, to get them to, to hang on. And, and they've done yeoman's work. I mean, mm -hmm. most of these places that adapted quickly to no inside dining, no outside dining, that Curbside couldn't really pickup. have... Mm -hmm. didn't really have a takeout business or, or a delivery business, they had to move pretty quickly to be able to, to, be able to do that. I mean, just having um, supplies on hand to package things. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the restaurants that aren't traditional, you know, takeout, they, all they really had was doggy bags and things like right. that to go. Phenomenal job mm -hmm. from, from, from them. And most of the time that was happening strictly at the management level where the managers and the chef and maybe one or two others were, were in there making things happen. 
and um, these people have moved up the ranks and it was just like being back there at day one and it was so if it, it's hard to remember it was so incredible to keeping our food supply going if they had shut down completely and everyone was forced to go to the supermarket you've got additional problems there yeah. well that was remarkable actually the as the rest of the food chains did uh, with the exception of toilet paper for some reason people thought <laughs> Toilet paper was nutritional, apparently, for the amount of a run there was on it. Now, one of the un unmentioned um, impacts uh, has been in the healthcare community. Um, Leahy Clinic, for instance, have you heard from them how damaging the uh, loss of revenue has been for them? I mean, they were shut down literally for two months preparing outside uh, services for COVID, which never materialized. Uh, then there was no MRIs, no specialty visits, etc. What are you hearing from them relative to the revenue impact? We hear from Leahy on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, certainly we don't get into their numbers of mm -hmm. revenue, but remember that it not only hurts them, it hurts everyone downstream from them. Sure. The physical therapy companies, you know, um, mm -hmm. other outsourced uh, downstream, whether it be medical devices, there's a lot to the economy that goes in through the, through the medical system. Uh, mm -hmm. People who then are, are visiting, you know, physical therapists or pharmacies. Um, people who have been a little reluctant to get back there. It's starting to happen now. But the telehealth industry uh, got, a, got a birth like, like nobody's business. Right. And, they and, can't take your blood pressure over the well, Zoom, they, they though. They can't, but pretty soon you'll be wearing a watch that will, that will take care of all that. This is true. But Leahy has done a, has done a phenomenal job in, um, in being there as, as the hospital um, to take care of people when they were, when they were in dire needs. Also, local um, health uh, organizations like AFC Urgent Care. They closed yeah. down a few of their facilities so they could, they could provide... Uh, necessary testing, drive-through testing mm -hmm. devices. They were one of the first in the state. Um, they were called out by the governor, mm -hmm. Dave Adams, and his team. Um, yeah, I saw that the resource. Stoneham one was the first one, I believe. Right, right. right. Waltham actually was first, was, but Stoneham. Second, but it yeah. kept some of the pressure off of the local hospitals that right. would have been doing this testing and allowed them to really take care of um, people who needed that critical care. And it seems like it might have been a long time ago, but we can remember seeing the news of what those emergency rooms looked like and, mm -hmm. you know, do we have enough ventilators? Uh, fortunately, people did pull together um, to, to work together and, and find solutions where we didn't know that we had that wherewithal. So I'm very proud of a lot of our, our local businesses. And as we continue to go forward, you'll see more collaboration and, uh, and teamwork. Now, let's go to the second tier. Um, the business owners obviously are uh, certain business owners, retail and restaurants are going to be in the brink in terms of operating. How is that affecting the property owners, your uh, your rental base uh, in the commercial property area? Do you s see a big impact coming there? Yeah, Phil, I do. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the end result will be, but I know right now in the greater Burlington area, although we've been allowed to go to 50% occupancy on uh, on commercial buildings and, and offices, we're we're a little less than ten percent, and you know, kind of a straw poll to see where we might be at the end of the year. We don't see a lot of a lot of change there. The good news is that these tenants tend to be the larger corporations, and they're paying their bills. Mm -hmm. So the property managers, uh, you know, continue to get income from that. However. There'll be a reassessment done at the next at the next five year lease, which some of them may be coming close to. Do I really need hundred thousand feet right. square feet? Do I really need to uh, you know to get it ready for the new normal with barriers if people are happy working home? I think what you'll see is that there will be a balance between working at home and people coming into the office because we are social creature social creatures. Mm -hmm. And people do need to, to be together, mm -hmm. and they're you know while collaborating through Zoom, and uh, and through the online services, there's nothing like being in a in a meeting, especially when it comes to brainstorming, mm -hmm. when offhand comments that might not be heard on on Zoom, are heard in a meeting and really develop that that uh, esprit de corps and teamwork that, that mm -hmm. are the foundation of uh, of any innovation. Right. Now this was brought home to me by my son actually, who works for a major financial house. Uh, who's, who is working at home uh, and his colleagues are all saying, you know, they work in Boston, they're all saying, you know, uh, it's unlikely that we'll be going back until the first part of next year and we don't really want to go back and from the productivity levels that are being gained, uh, uh, 
their bosses, the operations, are looking at the necessity, for instance, of having, in this, his case, 100,000 square feet in every major office market in the United States and indeed globally. So if we have a, a case of 50% of the employees all working from home, we're going to have continued downward pressure on the office market, aren't we? I, I believe so. Uh, one of the things, as people adapted to working from home, initially it was, it was difficult. There were you know, technical issues um, and, and just a different way of doing life. However, after about a month or so, People said, I don't mind not having to get up and get dressed and, and sit in traffic for, for an three hour. hours yeah, right. a sure. day. Every the day. quality of life came back. So I do believe there will be a bounce back. One of the great things that will happen here is it'll allow small businesses to get into areas that they previously were priced out of. Um, we've got a great innovation economy that drives the Commonwealth, and Burlington is a part of that. Mm -hmm. And in the past, there may have been some of these smaller startup companies that really couldn't afford space to be in around the other people. We've got Commercial some great, center, sure. We've got some great companies in here leading the way. Um, Leahy, Millipore, Oracle, mm. uh, Keurig. Keurig. Sure. These, are, yeah. these oh. are the ones that people, you know, the, the smaller companies want to be around. They want to be near those resources and be part of the game. And I'm hoping that it's going to open up some avenues for mm. some of those smaller companies to, to come in um, you don't have to have you know 100,000 square feet. Maybe you know 10,000 or 5,000 will do, but it will be part of the of the next wave of innovation. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other advantages of working from home actually has been the social impact of the family, uh, where you know Junior is right <laughs> sit right next door to you while you're working online. So uh, you know there's been a lot more family time. Uh, I, I guess that's a benefit as long as you're getting a paycheck. Now let's go to the next level, which is after all these impacts are washed out in terms of the economic viability of, of certain businesses, certain property owners, what conversations have you had about your municipalities, you also serve Wuben, about the impact on the tax rate, on the corporate tax rate? Do you see, commercial tax rate, excuse me, uh, do you see a stampede of, uh, of uh, abatement requests on the tax bill. It's pretty expensive to work here, uh, to own property here. What do you see the impacts going forward on both property tax and subsequently uh, impacts on the Burlington budget? Well, I think, again, we're fortunate with some of these larger companies that being tech companies, they weren't hurt quite as bad. They continue to pay their bills mm -hmm. and, and that, that it's not business as normal for anyone. But for them, as they continue to go forward, I don't think we're going to see the greatest impact there. Where we will, where we will see it, is in restaurants, in mm -hmm. hospitality. You know, yeah. uh, meals tax and hotel local tax. option, motel, hotel. Sure. Absolutely, that's yeah. going to that's going to have an effect. Burlington has been in a good position. They've been fairly conservative with their with their money. Mm -hmm. um, other communities, not so much. You know, when they've when they've added a teacher or two and go for a prop two and a half override. Um, but we will be impacted. There will be no doubt. Um, mm -hmm. This is a ripple effect, and what the business community is seeing right now will eventually, you know, result in in um, less revenue for the town. And, and to Paul Sagarino's credit, he's he's already ahead of this. And mm -hmm. we're we're trying to formulate the strategy first, understand how we will rebound, and what impact that will have. Um, nobody has the crystal ball, but nobody's putting their head in the sand mm -hmm. either. So. Yeah. Well, we haven't seen what the impact will be because if you have to raise the same re amount of revenue and commercial drops X factor, then that's going to subsequently transfer over to the residential. So we haven't seen uh, any project projections on what the res residential tax increase would be if there's a 10, 20, 30 percent depreciation of commercial value. So that, of course, I don't think happens until uh, next January yes, when the reval comes in. Right. Now, let's go to, um, you know, put you on the spot a little bit here with a retrospective. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. If you were running the program uh, from the state level, what are the things that you would have done in anticipation or in the, in the advent of this whole thing? Because certainly there's been this, many mistakes made. I think um, everyone has an opinion. Mm -hmm. And the state uh, was like anyone, was pressed with a monumental uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. They got more information they could possibly deal with. Um, you look at, the un let's take the unemployment 
uh, side of it. We went from 3% unemployment to close to 20. Mm -hmm. uh, a staff of 50 handling unemployment uh, for, for an inordinate amount of, of claimants. Mm -hmm. The state has the same problem. All of a sudden there was, you know, you've got a fixed budget and you've got a monumental challenge and you've got to, you know, be much more efficient. People are working from home. Government had the same challenges. When they right. closed people out of coming to work, um, I don't think that they had the top of the line computers like some of our, our mm -hmm. tech companies do. So they had stumbling blocks as well. Overall, I think that once they figured, hey, we can't take everyone's opinion, let's go through organizations like Chambers and um, some of the larger business associations. Let's see what the major challenges are. And they did a great job of listening to small business. Formulating a consensus. It, it really wasn't one of these cases of let's just talk to the big boys and, and, and figure out what they need. It really did boil down to a grassroots campaign to, to see what's going to happen to small business. While we all always try to shop, shop local, shop small businesses, those are the ones that were most vulnerable. And those are the ones that needed the immediate attention. Keeping in mind, there's a health concern here for all of us. Um, I think the state did a good job there. Sometimes it was just the lack of not knowing that was hard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when they came out, when the governor came out with a four-phase approach, there really wasn't a timeline, and initially there weren't um, hygiene and safety protocols that were associated with each of these. So as people would say, okay, if I do open, what am I going to need to do? What do I need to to procure as far as PPE goes? And you remember we had challenges with getting that for just the medical right. industry. So getting that information out a, a little bit quicker, but by and large, um, the, the challenge that we've been through, I think the, uh, the state and local government has done, has done a great job. And, and as a business person, you don't hear that a lot mm -hmm. from the business community. It's always, you know, they didn't do enough here, didn't do enough there. It's been overall, um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure dealing with a lot of these people. When you have a crisis, people show their true colors. And the concern that I've seen at, at every level with our, with our state rep, Ken Gordon, and City, uh, Senate, Senator Sidney Friedman, reaching out and saying, you know, are the small businesses getting what they need? Is there anything we can be doing? And it wasn't just a checkbox on, on their screen that they had to call up. You could see it was, it was heartfelt. One last question, another opinion question. You know, from the day that the Imperial College briefed uh, the presidency on the impact, potential impact of this thing, Two million dead in the U.S., five hundred thousand dead in the U.K. with their pre projections. How would you critique the media's reaction over the last four months? I mean, there hasn't been baseball, there hasn't been football, nothing of any any sort of organizational activity. So they focused solely on this. Uh, some people are calling it uh, uh, virus porn. Uh, do you think they've handled this in a responsible manner? I think we had a similar question, Phil, that you asked me when this first started. I gotta be honest, I've put my head down, I'm in the office, first thing in the morning, TV is off, I'm dealing with meetings and members, I get home and hear from my wife about some of the things that, that have been said on there. This, this is a challenge for all of us, mm -hmm. and I don't want to look back and say, hey, I was watching TV when I could have been answering the phone for, for a member that really right. needed the help. I look forward to the day that I can go back and say, what really happened here and, and how did the, the media do it? But I'll be honest, I really haven't been uh, able to, to see much of it at all. Good. <laughs> good. Because it, I've been home watching it and great, it, it hasn't been good. Okay, uh, what shot am I on? I'm on this shot. Okay, unfortunately we've run out of time. I'd like to thank our guest, very gracious guest, by the way, who's always available to us, Rick Parker, President of Burlington Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Phil. Thank you for joining us.